Hi everyone, welcome back to Surfing Baseball with Ed Lynch, and here is the star of the show, former Chicago Cubs general manager, ex-MLB player with the Mets and Cubs, Ed Lynch. And Ed, a uh, few weeks ago, the first domino to fall in the managerial change was Pedro Griffel with the White Sox, and then this week, Scott Service with the Mariners. So we're going to talk about managerial changes, GM changes on this show. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the time of year. Obviously, Pedro Grifol, uh, they had to do something. You know, they, they I mean, I, I know Jerry Reinsdorf very well, and he's one, one of the most loyal people you'll ever find. I'd rather work for Jerry Reinsdorf probably than than 90% of the other owners in baseball, not because they're impatient, but he is so patient and so loyal. So a change really had to be made. But this is the time of year, and, and you know, we already saw Scott Service Scott Service was a little different than Pedro Grifol. Obviously, the White Sox are out of it. They're eliminated. They're having a, a just a, a year to forget. But I think Jerry Depoto in Seattle is really trying to give them a boost, you know, with a month left. And hopefully a change of, of manager will give them a new outlook. And, and, it, and it's really funny sometimes how – you have the same exact club on the field day after day, and then you insert a new manager. And for some reason, and there are reasons, the team just plays better. And so it will be remain to see. It remains to see how how they'll do in in Seattle. But that move was try to give them a shot in the arm to get going. And so we'll see if that works. And when you were GM of the Cubs, Ed, um, I believe you made two managerial changes. If, if you don't mind, can you kind of talk about that and, and maybe what our listeners may not understand about how changes are made and, and the behind the scenes that goes into it? Well, my, the first one I made is when I got the job, and it was a very unique situation, which may never happen again in the history of baseball. I mean, I got the job during the strike, the, the famous strike in 1994, I was named GM on October 10th, 1994. Tom Treblehorn had been the manager. The Cubs did not have a very good year that was cut short by the uh, strike. So I knew I wanted to come in and make a change. And and uh, it was kind of a, you know, not funny, but it was a tough situation. Tom was getting on a cruise and, and, and uh, you know, I had to let him go by phone. I don't like to do that, but sometimes, you know, you just have to. So um, he was very professional about it. And I like to think that I was too. And then the other change was Jim Ribbleman, who to this day, we've had him on our show and, and uh, you know, we're good friends now. And that was just, you know, we had to ch hopefully change at the top would, would give us a different direction emotionally and motivationally in the dugout. And so I hired uh, uh, Don Baylor, you know, the first African-American manager in the history of the Chicago Cubs. So all of us are very proud about that. So those are the two changes I made. And then in thinking about that too, GM changes, um, let, let's talk a little bit, and then we'll get into the current, you know, kind of who's on the hot seat, who's not. But with GM changes, you mentioned that, you know, you came in wanting to make managerial change when you were the GM. How does that all I mean, is that typical or was that are those one offs kind of talk about that when you're interviewing maybe for a GM job? Is that something that's brought up? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And, um, you know, every situation is different. As I said, my my situation was so unique that we had no idea when the strike was going to be settled. So, I mean, I, I went in, Andy McPhail interviewed me and I and I said I would like to bring in and I gave him you know, a, a couple of names and, uh, you know, he was, he was good with that. And, uh, you know, it was a very unique situation, but, you know, when you're trying, I want to take a step back on the managers. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is to fire your manager. Now I'm not saying easy in terms of the emotional impact it has on, on the manager. You know, you're basically taking away his livelihood for the, for the short term, hopefully in his case, um, and it's a traumatic thing and it's, you know, it's going to be in every newspaper in the country. And, and nowadays, well, it's going to be on every internet service that, uh, you know, that the manager has been changed. And look at Scott service, you know, he, he, you couldn't go on any outlet, uh, internet, um, social media where it wasn't announced. So it's a traumatic event for a lot of people. But I say that because it's easy because, you know, you, okay, you make a managerial change. You make a, you know, you bring the guy in, you tell him you're going to make a change. 
that in a lot of ways is a lot easier. The thing you have to think about before you do it is, okay, who am I going to hire? <laughs> you know, and you know, and the media is always going to say, God bless them. You know, like right now, if you let somebody go, we'll go get Bruce Bochy. Well, last I looked, he was under contract with another club. So um, the difficult thing is because the pool is very small, really, of – managers who are out there who have managed in the big leagues with a great deal of success that want to continue to manage and who would want to manage your club. I mean, if, if you have a, and I'm not talking about specific, but if you have a manager like a Dusty Baker or a Lou Pinella back in, you know, the younger days, all of our younger days, they might not want to come to your club. You know, just offering them a job is not a guarantee they're going to take it because you might be in a rebuild or they might not want to come into your division or your city. So it's not it's it's a very difficult process and everybody's going to have an opinion on it. So, I mean, again, firing the manager could be very easy. Finding a new one could be very difficult. And talking about that, too. So two things. First, um, what about so. Ed, just throwing a hypothetical out there. Let's say you you hire me as the manager. Are you then delegating me to hire my own staff, or as the GM, are you going to have a say in that process? Well, well, that's a great question. You know, because everyone's different. I mean, if you're going to bring in when the Cubs brought in uh, Dusty Baker, I think it was in two thousand and early two thousands. I mean, a guy like Dusty Baker is going to want to bring in his staff. If you bring in a guy like Lou Pinella. He's going to say, I'll take this job, but I'm bringing my own staff. Now, you might negotiate with him and say, okay, listen, Lou or Dusty, and they understand this because they they understand the minor leagues. I, I really would like to name one or two guys from our minor league system to come onto your staff. It's great for morale. I mean, the worst thing, if you're a minor league player development guy and you're out there busting your ass seven days a week for eight months and – they hire a new manager and then he brings in his entire staff from the outside. And, and some of those guys might have less experience than, you know, you have as a coach or manager in the Meyer league system that could cause some problems. It's certainly a big morale uh, problem. Uh, so I would try to reason with them before we, we consummate the deal, tell them what I'm thinking. Don't wait to hire them and then say that. It might be too late. So, yeah, you try, you try to, uh, you know, the old saying guys would laugh about is, you know, okay, I'll give them one guy he can go drink him with, crying their beer after the game, but the rest of them are going to be mine. But that's, that's fine if you have a young manager. But if you bring in a veteran guy, he's going to want to bring in his people. So the trend seems to be uh, – it was funny. I was looking at um, A.J. Hinch. I remember when A.J. Hinch was named the manager of the Diamondbacks on May 8th, 2009. The headlines were never managed at, at any level. And that yeah. was like, holy cow. And A.J. took a, a lot of grief for that, you know. And now it seems like if you hire a manager that's managed before, that's a big story. You know, most of the guys that get hired now have ever managed, certainly never managed in the big leagues. So, those guys are different. You know, they're, you know, first guy, you know, if a guy comes in interview as manager, now let's take Dave Roberts, for example, you know, Dave, I think has done a great job. You know, people are saying that maybe he might be in trouble. I think that is absolutely ridiculous I agree. with the injuries they've had. He's done a super job with that organization. But when he first signed on as manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, He's not going to sit there and say, hey, I demand I bring him all my staff or I'm not taking this job. No, he wouldn't do that. He's not crazy. So, you know, he's going to inherit some people and there's going to be people from the system that come up for the first time. So every situation is different. But, you know, when Scott Service, excuse me, when A.J. Hinch, um, you know, took that job, it was a firestorm of protest in the media. And now it's almost the other way around. Yeah, and then I think, too, you talked a little bit earlier about um, contracts maybe coming up. I'm, I'm talking specifically about Miami. So Skip Schumacher's contract is is up at the end of the year. And, and first, I'll say this. 
it has to be awkward going to the office every day, knowing that, hey, I wasn't extended. I know at the college level, it's, you know, you're either all in or all out. Like one year deals are just not a thing. Otherwise, it's awkward. But is there something else that might be going on or what's kind of your take on a guy's going in? He's basically a lame duck manager, but, you know, it's happened with Chicago, too. The Cubs didn't renew Joe Madden's contract. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that you wouldn't want to have a manager whose contract is running out at the end of the year. But that seems to have gone by the wayside. I mean, I see it seems to be more and more common now. And I think that's that's a byproduct of the manager having diminished power in that dugout or in that clubhouse. And let's face it, you know, whether you like analytics or you don't like analytics, they have an increased influence in that dugout in terms of the lineup card, the uh, pitching staff, um, who pitches when, who gets days off, who goes on the IL. I mean, that manager used to be the captain of the ship. And any, you talk to anybody who's been a captain of a ship or any Navy guy, when you're a captain of a ship at sea, you're like the king. You know, you have – ultimate power. Now, as general manager, we're going to talk a lot and we're going to negotiate constantly. But, you know, that that manager's uh, influence seems to be diminished in the in the dugout somewhat by the analytic guys. And, you know, when you're looking at managers, I don't want to digress here, but when you're looking at managers and I've done a lot of talking about this over the years and a lot of thinking about this, the top three things that guy's got to do. Number one, he's got to motivate the players. That, that's the most difficult thing. That's where a guy like Lou Pinello was unmatched. I mean, Lou could really motivate the players. And Dusty was like that too. Number two, you got to be able to handle the pitching staff. Some guys need help with that. And that's why, you, you know, you might need a strong pitching coach if a guy is, is more a position player guy. And handling that pitching staff is vital. And then number three, depending on, you know, what your market is, and I was in these markets in New York and Chicago, you got to have somebody that can handle the media. He's your spokesman for your organization for six months during the season, twice a day, every day. So the guy's got to have some talent at that. Now, everything else beyond that always goes back to number one, motivate the players, you know, putting guys in a position where they got a chance to be successful. You know, don't, don't put in a, you know, uh, a right-handed pitcher to face a left-hander who's hitting right-handed pitching better than anybody in baseball. I mean, that would be silly to do stuff like that, but you know, everything after that, giving guys days off at the right time, giving the guys a pat on the back or a kick in the ass, all that stuff goes back to number one, motivating the players. So in my opinion, it takes some experience doing that. Uh, to be good at it. And you don't want guys to learn and make their biggest mistakes at the major league level. You'd like if And everybody's going to make mistakes, whether it's motivating players or screwing up a lineup card, whatever. You like to see them make those mistakes in the minor leagues before they get to the big leagues. But unfortunately, you know, some guys seem to be rushed to the big leagues nowadays. For sure. And last two, a couple questions here. So, um, and not to put you on the spot, but I think it's important do managers see it coming when they're fired most of the time? Or And, and I know you talk about every situation is different, but are there conversations leading up to like, hey, we're probably going to make a change if you don't do this, this, and this? Or is it coming from ownership and then you're the one getting the call saying, go go get rid of this guy? Like, how does that all kind of transpire? Well, it's it's that's a, that's a great question because it's pretty obvious. You know, the major leagues is, the, is not the try-hard league. That's the get-it-done league. You know, and, and I'll, I'll take a step back from that. When I was a farm director and I had seven affiliates uh, uh, in the U.S., basically, not even talking about Dominican Summer League, you know, you've got seven managers in the minor leagues. We had three A clubs, two short season clubs, and then double AA, A, triple A. You know, and my job was to evaluate the performance of every one of those managers. So, you know, you can't start out by telling those guys, hey, it's all about winning. You know, if you're an A-ball, it's all about winning. So, you know, you can judge it by that. So, you know, a guy, I mean, I've seen managers get to the playoffs, you know, in the minor leagues and get fired because they're, they're not doing what their job is. Your job is to develop the players towards the big leagues. Now, if there's, if they're, 
you know, n- never if they're pinch hitting for prospects in the second inning because the bases are loaded and two outs, or they're overusing that co- that reliever that's got a chance to pitch in the big leagues because they don't want to win at all costs, win, win, win. That could be injurious to the players on the roster. So the standard at the minor league level is a lot different at the big league level. So, I mean, if you're a manager, if you're Pedro Grafal, you know you're not going to survive. I mean, it's when you have a record-setting loss year, and I'm not. That's nothing to take away from Pedro and his efforts, but sometimes it's pretty obvious. And I think you know the number one thing that every manager has said to me, and I was probably a little bit guilty of this too, is uh, the, the GM stops talking to to them. You know, the the, the communication is kind of not there. Right. You know, when you're when you're 12 games under 500 and you're 17 games back in the wild card, chances are something's going to happen. So, I mean, you can go down there and talk to them and talk to them, but, you know, what do you say? I mean, it's like, hey, it's pretty obvious what's going on. You know, try to win as many games as we can here, you know. And then when the media is asking you about it all the time, you say that decision will be made after the season. Or, you, you know, then they go to ownership and they get the dreaded, you know, stamp of approval. You know, he's our manager, and then two weeks later he's gone, you know. So uh, it's it's a very difficult situation in the major leagues because it's so visible, and everybody's hanging on every single word you say, and you get that question incessantly. And, and you know, you have to just stick to your guns and say, listen, we'll evaluate at the end of the year and let the season play out, and we'll go from there. And ending here, um, let's talk about speaking of that dreaded vote of confidence and the uh, what's going on now with we're about to turn. I can't believe it's almost September, but that's the time this all happens. So hot seat right now. The New York Post is saying, you know, the media is saying Aaron Boone with the Yankees, Oliver Marmol with the Cardinals. Uh, You mentioned Dave Roberts. Again, I agree with you. I think it's silly, but allegedly based on what the media is saying, he's on the hot seat. So. Um, Skip Schumacher's contract. So there's going to be changes, but what do you foresee and, and what do you think may be a, a surprise that we may not necessarily see coming either? Uh, well, that's hard to tell. You know, it's hard to tell what teams are thinking. But when you have uh, a team with such unprecedented success year after year after year, uh, like the St. Louis Cardinals and like the New York Yankees, you know, those managers are going to be on the hot, especially if they've been there a while. Like Aaron Boone is going to be on the hot seat every year, no matter what. They lose five in a row in June, he's on the hot seat. You know, right. they win 10 in a row in July, nobody notices. They lose five in a row in August, he's on the hot seat. So it's hard to tell what's going on there. And and again, I mean, I, how much influence do these managers have over what's happening on the field? I mean, maybe somebody else should be held more accountable to the lack of production than the manager. Maybe some of the decisions that are handed down to him in terms of who plays, who doesn't, who pitches, who doesn't, you know, there's a dynamic there. And so maybe it's, you know, that focus of responsibility should shift somewhat. It can't shift totally off the manager. He's the guy that everybody sees. Right. And, and you know, he's the guy that, that everybody wants to hold accountable, but there's a lot of dynamic forces behind him that are, that maybe should be accountable also. And I don't know if, if we're at that point with guys like, you know, Aaron Boone. Now, Oliver Marmol is a different situation. He's not as well-known a guy. Didn't have the playing career of an Aaron Boone. But they are used to winning in St. Louis. Yeah. And I saw it the other day they had less than 30,000, and that's at a game, and that's the first time in a long time. But, you know, Paul Goldschmidt, uh, is not playing the way he's he's played in the past. Uh, Nolan Arenado is not having a Nolan Arenado year. Is that the manager's fault? No. But who's going to pay the price? The manager. So we, it's too hard to tell at this point, but I assume there will be changes at the end of the year. Yeah, and, and last question here, Ed, and, and again, appreciate your time with, with this. Um, what do you foresee with with managerial changes? Um, obviously are are coming year in and year out. You know, there's always there's always changes, but 
how much of an influence does like attendance and things like that or, or the media's perspective play into decisions or do they just try to keep that out of it and let's make it wins loss decision? Well, I think, um, again, at the major league level, depending on your club and the history of your club, winning is the most important thing. I mean, if Aaron Boone doesn't get to the postseason, that's going to be a bigger black mark on his career than than Scott Shoemaker not getting to the to the the postseason with the Marlins. I mean, every situation is different, but ownership uh, is involved. You know, I don't think there's there's no GM that's going to fire a manager without running it by the owner first, and that owner is. You know, this is his baby. This is his probably one of his biggest assets that he has. And, you know, he cares deeply about it. And and there's going to be a lot of discussions before that kind of decision is made. And um, so on, on, on the last thing I'll say is, you know, again, the firing the manager is quote unquote easy. But the general manager, that's a whole different ball ballgame. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're firing someone or letting someone go who is responsible for the entire organization, not just what's going on in the dugout. So you've got a guy who's responsible for player development, scouting, you know, your international scouting, uh, you know, the major league club. Um, so, I mean, when you let the general manager go, you're really, really taking away a major part of where your organization is going throughout your organization going into the future. Now, there seems to be a lot of uh, presidents of baseball operations now. That that title did not exist when I was a general manager. So it's almost like that president of baseball operations is the general manager, and the general manager is more like chief operating, operating officer, something like that, So of the baseball department. So you know, that, that has changed somewhat. So, um, you know, unfortunately this is the time of year and I, I will say, you know, everybody, and this has not changed. Major league baseball does not want teams to make newsworthy changes to their organization in the, after the season, when there's a postseason game that day. <laughs> so, you, you know, Game one of the World Series, the last thing Major League Baseball wants is the New York Yankees saying they're changing their manager or general manager. You know, that takes away the focus of what's going on in the field. Now everybody has to answer those questions. So that's why Monday, September 30th, is like the U2 song, Sunday, Bloody Sunday. It's Monday, Bloody Monday, unfortunately. So if there are changes to be made, September 30th, that Monday is going to be a big day to make them. So it's a traumatic day for everybody in the organization. And that goes all the way down through scouting and player development. So it's a tough time of year for everybody. And I never take lightly people losing their jobs. It's happened to me. It's happened to just about every guy that was in the game as long as I have been. And it's a very traumatic thing to go through. For sure. Well, nobody better to talk about this than and again it is traumatic and it's but it you know it's part of the game it's something i feel like we have to talk about so nobody better than someone who was a gm ed lynch ed again appreciate your time surfing baseball with ed lynch follow us on linkedin facebook youtube vimeo x formerly known as twitter instagram um, again, I just posted the interview, Ed, Wally Backman and Howard Johnson did, um, great content there, a lot about hitting. So follow us surfing baseball with Ed Lynch. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you.